In the last 50 years, we've graduated some 12,000 women from our MBA, <clears throat> DBA, and executive education programs. You are 800 of them. This is just so awesome. <laughs> I study gender, and I teach at the Harvard Business School, and I cannot tell you how amazing it is for me to stand before you today. How many HBS alumni does it take to change the world? <laughs> I think this looks like a pretty good start. In the past 20 years, the media have picked up that women are now a significant part of the professional and managerial labor force. This graphic represents the findings of a study by two of my colleagues here at Harvard Business School, Lakshmi Ramarajan and Kathleen McGinn, together with Debbie Kolb, whom some of you spent some time with this morning learning about negotiation. It shows how the narrative on gender and work has, has shifted over the past 20 years. The graphic tra tracks uh, articles on gender and work published from 1991 to 2009 in the national and business press. The light blue line represents articles that focus on gender bias, stereotypes, harassment, conscious exclusion. So you can see that in the early to mid 90s, the focus was on bias. And then bias declines from that point forward as a theme in the media. The dark blue line represents articles that focus on women's underrepresentation, such as portrayals of women stuck at lower levels, unable to reach top leadership positions. These articles discuss biases that are more complex and less overt than in the earlier period, things like the lack of opportunity for women, the old boys network. And what you see is a relatively brief shift as this theme rises, peaking in about 1998. Then starting in about 2001, the green line increases dramatically. And these articles are about work-family conflict, a focus on women's childbearing and responsibilities at home. It looks like it starts to decline at the end of the timeline here, but I would guess that if we tracked articles in the last four years beyond the time frame of this study, this trend would probably surge up in the last year or so. As an example of this last trend on work-family conflict, many of you may remember the 2003 piece in the Sunday Times Magazine by Lisa Belkin on the opt-out revolution, where she argued Women aren't making it to the top because they don't want to. They'd prefer to stay at home raising children and tending to the home front. And then here we are today with people still, <laughs> still referencing Anne Marie Slaughter's article, her very controversial article appearing in The Atlantic last summer, which she draws on her own experience stepping down from her role as the first woman dir deputy director first woman director of policy and planning for the State Department, and returning to her professorship at Princeton in order to be closer to her family, her oldest son in particular, who is, struggling, who is a struggling young adolescent, to explain why it is that women still can't have it all. Now, whatever you think of this article, I think many of us would agree that it has jump-started a real dialogue about the factors that impede women's advancement into leadership roles. That is the dialogue that I would like to engage you all in today. And I like to think it's a more sophisticated dialogue than we've seen in the past, one that considers a whole array of factors at play. Not just the personal decisions of individual women, which of course are important, but also the organizational and cultural factors that research now shows are huge contributors to those decisions a whole set of experiences that look less like women opting out and more like women being pushed out by organizations that demand a 24-7 work schedule. As well as women being pulled out by a culture that promulgates a compelling, some might say guilt-inducing, image of mothering that it's, that's hard to live up to while you're trying to hold a job. Now, I'm sure that if we collected the stories in this room, 
we could generate a treasure trove of insights into the question of what has propelled and what has impeded women's advancement into leadership positions. Well, that's exactly what we've done. And today, I'll share with you what we're learning from that effort. As part of the school's broader culture and community initiative, and also to commemorate the 50th anniversary of women's admission to the two-year MBA, we decided to undertake a study of the gendered dimensions of the lives and careers of our alumni, both women and men, which we believe are important to understand if we are to accelerate the advancement of women leaders who make a difference in the world. We wanted to learn to what extent does conventional wisdom about what highly educated women are doing and experiencing square with reality, with your reality? And so we launched the Life and Leadership After HBS survey. With this survey, we're interested in knowing what are you doing? What realities have you faced? What decisions and trade-offs have you made? How satisfied are you with your career and personal life? What factors do you believe have slowed women's career advancement? And what factors have been important to your own career advancement? And what did you expect? What, and what did you expect and what have you actually experienced regarding roles with your spouse partner, if you have or have had one? First, with respect to career, whose takes priority? And then with respect to the division of labor and household, to, to, to the division of household work and child care, who takes primary responsibility? How did you define success when you left HBS? How would you define it now? I'm not going to cover all of these topics today, but I'm going to touch on most. So here are my aspirations for us today, here in this hour, but also more broadly, as you participate in this summit over the next two days. I want us to challenge conventional wisdom about gender and work. I want to begin to reshape the dialogue. I want you to leave here with a new insight, a new angle, a new idea that will change how you think about something. And then I want you to think about how you would act on that new insight. And as things occur to you that you can do differently, write them down over this next day and a half. And finally, I want us to create a forum going forward where we can continue to have this kind of a dialogue and shape our practice. But before we go there, let me give you just a bit of background on how this project came to be and how it fits with the broader culture and community initiative at the school. Nearly three years ago now, just as Nathan Noria was about to take up his post as the new dean of the Harvard Business School, he asked me to lead an initiative to take a careful look at the status of women at the school. And his question was, why are women not reaching parity with men at HBS? Women are underrepresented on our faculty, and like most organizations, they're increasingly underrepresented as you go up the hierarchy. We are at 20% in our tenured rank. Not bad for a top flight business school. But in leadership positions at the school, women were even more outnumbered. The percentage of women in our student body had been inching up a percentage point or two every couple of years. And we were at about 36, 37 percent when Nathan became dean. Again, not bad for a top tier business school, but not where we would have liked to be. Finally, and most distressing, our women students were underperforming in the classroom relative to men students which is to say that women were receiving lower grades on average than men, and we knew this had been a ca the case for a good long time. This was even public information because we list our Baker scholars every year, and one needed only to count the number of women in that group to see that year after year, they were dramatically underrepresented relative to their proportion in the class as a whole. And about a year before Nathan became dean, one of my colleagues, a tenured woman, pointed this fact out at the end of the year faculty meeting when we vote on degrees and honors. It's something that was knowable for many years, but it was never voiced. 
But once it was voiced, things began to shift at the school. Students became alarmed and proactive. We will not let the women in our section underperform was the rallying cry of many women and a few men as well. Faculty began to examine their call patterns more systematically, and all the while these efforts were raising people's consciousness at the school. So much so that when the dean had his one-on-one -on -one conversations with the faculty to develop the priorities he would champion in his administration, gender was on a lot of people's minds, and he listened. He made inclusion one of his five priorities. And so this is how he came to ask me to head up an initiative at the school, the Culture and Community Initiative, with this mission, to cultivate a culture at HBS that enables all members of our community to thrive and realize their full potential for advancing the mission of the Harvard Business School of educating leaders who make a difference in the world. So for the past three years, We've been deeply engaged in an inquiry into how gender and other dimensions of identity play out in our own institution. And as a side note, I'm happy to note that the gender grade gap has now closed. For the past two years, women and men at the Harvard Business School have received the same grades. People ask us how we did it. It was probably no one thing, but a whole set of things, beginning with talking about it, and then students and faculty proactively taking steps to address it. But we're not just looking inward. We're also turning our attention outward. And so the W50 gave us a wonderful opportunity to make public this commitment to turn outward and to ask the question, what can Harvard Business School do to accelerate the advancement of women leaders who make a difference in the world? What is our distinctive advantage in this arena? This is when we turn to you. You are one of our distinctive advantages. We have a world-class alumni. And another is that we do cutting-edge research on problems of managerial re relevance. And we realized if we bring these two things together, we could do something pretty awesome. So I'm going to share with you some of what we found. But before I get there, let me just say a word about the sample. We surveyed all 12,000 um, of our women alums from our MBA and doctoral programs, from the early certificate programs, such as the Harvard Radcliffe program in business administration, and from our comprehensive leadership programs in executive education. We also surveyed a stratified random sample of 14,000 men. In total, we invited 25,810 women and men to take the survey. Nearly 6,500 of you completed it, sharing your life experiences and perspectives with us for an overall response rate of 25%. 32% for women and 19% for men. <laughs> so let me ask you, just a show of hands here, how many of you filled out the survey? Yes! <laughs> so I'm going to be telling you about you, literally you, today. 80% um, of the respondents attended the MBA program or one of the earlier programs. 19% attended a comprehensive leadership program in executive education. And 1% attended one of our doctoral programs. All the numbers I'm going to present today have been properly weighted using standard methods. We are scholars. Um, we've also conducted extensive analyses of the sample for any signs of bias to see, for example, whether some types of people were more likely to respond to the survey than others, and we have found none to speak of. OK, so now I'm going to clobber you with data. This is literally hot off the press. We've had very little time to digest findings and less time 
to package them. But I have the most amazing staff, all women. <laughs> and they have worked literally, literally, night and day to bring this presentation to you today. So thank you, Lori Shannon. <laughs> and Sharon Mosguy. <clears throat> Okay, now I'm, I'm aware that some of you sitting at the edge of the auditorium are unfortunately able to see the screen behind me. So we have some monitors set up here on either side of the room, but I don't think that they're going to be particularly visible to you either. So my apologies for that, and I'll try to report the important numbers and summarize as we go, so hopefully you won't miss anything. We've also compiled a preview of the findings into a short report which will be available for you to pick up on your way out, so no need to take notes. OK. So here we go. The first question that we speak to is, what are you all doing? I'm going to show you a lot of numbers, so please bear with me. But I wanted to be able to speak to everyone in the room. And here today, we have women in every one of these categories, as well as a few good men. <laughs> For this table, we have you split up by generation. So across the top of the table, you see Gen Y. These are people ages uh, 25 to 30. Gen X, ages 31 to 47. Baby boomers, ages 48 to 66. And older generations are people over 67. 67 or over. Down the side of the table are the primary roles that you could be in. Employed full-time, employed part-time, retired, caring for children full-time, and so on. And in the first column are the totals across the full sample. OK. So first looking at Gen Y and the older generations, we see that they're pretty much as we would expect. The younger alums, both men and women, are nearly all working full time. They work on average 50 to 50, 55 to 60 hours a week. A few are employed part time, but not many. The majority of older generations, as we would expect, are retired. Men are somewhat more likely to be employed either full time working 40-ish hours a week or part-time working around 20 hours a week. OK, so now let's see how you do predicting some of the remaining numbers. <laughs> so let's take caring for children full-time, highlighted in the yellow over on the left-hand side of the screen. What percentage of women alums would you estimate are caring for children full-time? And I'll tell you up front, there isn't much difference here between Gen X and baby boom women. So let me ask, I'm going I'm to do a vote. So how many of you think the number is over 50%? OK. Between, 20, between 35 and 50%. Between 20 and 35 percent. And less than 20 percent? Okay. A lot less than 20 percent. Only 10. side can't see. So let me tell you, only 10% of baby boomer women and 9% of Gen X women are out of the paid workforce raising children full time. 
So that number is considerably lower than most of you imagined. It's considerably lower than just about anyone I've asked has imagined. And it's certainly far lower than the media would lead us to believe. And by the way, I don't show these figures, but only 3% of these women who are now at home full-time caring for children say they do not plan to go back to work, 3%. 11% are unsure, and the remaining 86% plan to go back to paid work in one way or another. Okay, so then the question is, just how much are women working? Well, here's full time along with their weekly hours. 74% of Gen X women are employed full time. For baby boomers, the numbers drop for both men and women with women at 57% full-time employed and men at 72%. And they're all working about 50, 55 hours a week on average. And part-timers? A smaller number of Gen X women than you might have thought, 13%, with men at only 2%. And for baby boomers, both men and women are more likely to be working part-time at about 15 to 20%. Here are the rest of the categories, just to complete the table. No real surprises here. Virtually none of the Gen Xers are retired yet. 7% of the men and women baby boomers are retired. A few baby boomers are caring for adults full time. And a smattering are doing other things. Now this next slide focuses just on Gen X women, a generation a lot of studies in the literature are focused on. And it shows you how having children shapes this story. And the story is, as we would expect, the more children, the less likely women are to be, full, to be working full-time, and the more likely they are to be working part-time or to be out of the paid workforce entirely caring for children. But these percentages are higher for full-time employed than we've seen in other samples of highly educated women. 79% of those with one child are working full-time, down to 63% for those with two or more children. And it's interesting to note that the majority of Gen X women, 53%, have two or more children. Okay, so now let's take a look at what these women who are not in the paid workforce full-time are doing. In previous surveys of our alumni, we've given people the option of checking that they are, quote, involved as a community leader or volunteer. But what we did in this survey is we double-clicked on that activity, taking a closer look at what people's pro bono and volunteer work is. These would include efforts for civic and community organizations, professional associations, educational, religious, and art institutions, social, environmental, and other causes. Because I want to remind us that at Harvard Business School, we educate leaders who make a difference in the world. We don't educate leaders for the sole purpose of making money or to run a Fortune 500 company. I mean, that's fine, but. <laughs> and I'm guessing that many of you, even those of you who are employed full-time, spend some, some amount of time in, in this kind of work. Let me get a show of hands. How many of you hold significant leadership responsibilities or are regularly involved in some pro bono or volunteer work? Okay, so I'm guessing that about 44% of you at least raised your hand. <laughs> but this is what it looks like for all alumni. Almost half of you are engaged in pro bono or volunteer work as leaders or regularly involved. So here's what it looks like for women who are caring for children full time. Two thirds are in leadership roles or regularly involved. And for women employed part-time, it's almost as high at 63%. So what do I want you to take away from this first set of slides? Number one, far fewer HBS alumni are at home caring for children full-time, and far more are in full-time paid employment than most people think, certainly than is portrayed in the media. Number two, 
The story of women leaving full-time paid work or leaving the workforce altogether is largely one about women who have two or more children. And number three, a sizable majority of women who are not in the paid workforce full-time are engaged in other kinds of civic and community work, many of them in positions of leadership. Now let's take a quick look at those of you who are employed full-time. What kinds of roles do you hold? We see several notable gender differences here. First, men are more likely to be self-employed for at least part of their employment, 40% versus 24% for women. Second, men are more likely to hold a position for which they have profit and loss responsibilities, or the nonprofit equivalent, 65% versus 49% uh, for women. And finally, men are more likely to be a member of, the, or, of their organization's top management team, 70% versus 47% for women. And I should say that we excluded self-employment from these numbers, since most people who are self-employed would automatically be <laughs> members of their organization's top management team. So these numbers reflect a more general trend of men holding positions of greater power than women. And we'll investigate these differences much more as we uh, get further into the analyses. OK, so on to some findings about what you expected when you left HBS and what you've experienced in your life since then. Here again, I'm just going to share you a little teaser. We asked you, upon leaving HBS, or if you were an exec ed participant when you started your career, did you expect to have a spouse partner whose career would have had a lower priority than yours, a higher priority, or the same priority? What I'm going to show you in this chart are only the responses of those alumni who, in fact, do or did have a spouse partner, and who indicated that when they left HBS or started their career, they expected that their spouse or partner's career would have the same priority as theirs. So all the people I'm going to show you in this chart started out with egalitarian expectations in this regard, and now I'm going to show you what they actually experienced. I wish this were interactive, because I would love to know what you think <laughs> before I tell you. OK. Um, so I'm presenting uh, the women first here. And what this blue bar represents is the percent of women in each generation whose egalitarian expectations were met in reality. Now, perhaps not surprisingly, more women in Gen Y, a little over half, than in earlier generations have achieved this goal so far. <laughs> I don't mean to be pessimistic. <laughs> sorry? No, sorry. Let me, I'm glad you said that. So you're not, you, so this slide are, is everybody who started out with an egalitarian expectation. This blue bar right now, he, so far, this is a combination of expectation and reality. These are people who had egalitarian expectations, and they were met in reality. OK, so I'm not going to show you an expectation bar and then a reality bar. We tried that. It was too complicated. <laughs> so I'm simplifying a little bit. And I think one of the interesting things is, you know, who's starting out with egalitarian expectations and what happens? So here's. OK, so the numbers are, it'd be great if I could see them. Um, uh, yeah, so a little, so the highest number is for Gen Y, and that's just over 50%. And what you can see on the Y axis, just so you can judge, that's 100% at the top. So if it's a third of the way up that axis, it's about, a, it's about 33%. OK, so 53% for Gen Y. 36% for Gen X, 36% for baby boomers, and 38% for older. So about a little more than a third for the other generations, and a little over half for Gen Y. Uh, yeah. 
So it may be that Gen Yers are more egalitarian, or it may be that they've had a pretty short time frame for <laughs> testing reality. <laughs> Most of these women don't have children yet. <laughs> okay, now I'm showing you the percentages for those whose egalitarian expectations were not met because their spouse or partner's career ended up having a higher priority than theirs. So for heterosexual couples, this means that they ended up in a more conventional situation than they expected. And we see that about a quarter of Gen Xers and baby boomer women are in this situation. Okay? Finally, this last bar, this last part of the bar, shows percentages for those with egalitarian expectations that were not met because their spouse or partner's career had a lower priority than theirs. Since for heterosexual couples, this would be an unconventional situation, we see far fewer of these in any generation, although not an insignificant number for baby boomer women, 16%. And now overall, we can see, so now you just look at the height of the bar. That is, that, that is fully the proportion in each generation that started out with egalitarian expectations. So women in the baby boom generation had the highest level of egalitarian expectations, 80%, pretty high, which probably reflects the idealistic times of the 60s and 70s <laughs> when we baby boomers came of age. Okay, now let me turn to men. I'm going to just give it to you all at once here. So their generational pattern mirrors women's. But we can see that they're pretty dramatically lower across the board, meaning that in general, the men were less likely than the women to hold egalitarian expectations in the first place. Also, as we might expect, to the extent that their egalitarian expectations were not met in reality, those are the bars above the light blue. Um, it was because their spouse or partner's career ended up being a lower priority than theirs. And again, for heterosexual couples, this would be the conventional outcome. So this overall picture is a rather interesting mismatch between the women and the men. And I'm looking forward to seeing what we find among those alumni who partnered with fellow HBS grads. <laughs> We have about 750 of them to see if there's a similar mismatch or perhaps they held similar expectations. And I really can't wait to share this with my students. <laughs> OK. So um, then just quickly, here's the same type of chart, but for the question, did you expect to have a spouse or partner who would do more than 50% of the child care, less than 50%, or did you expect to share child care equally? And this is only the responses of alumni who, in fact, do or did have a spouse partner or partner, as well as children, and who indicated that when they left HBS or started their career, they, they uh, expected their spouse or partner to share equally in the child care. So the first thing to notice is that the bars are much lower overall than in the previous chart, suggesting that women are more likely to have egalitarian expectations for careers than for childcare. With a match between expectation and reality being less and less as the generations get older, the light blue segment at the base of the bars gets smaller. Okay, now I'm gonna share for you with men. Is anybody surprised? <laughs> so very low bars overall. Meaning that 
basically less than 10% of our male alumni population who have a spouse or a partner and children start out expecting to share childcare equally. And with the exception of Gen Y men, which is very low to start, and by the way, is a very small number of people because most Gen Yers are not yet partnered with children. At least half of, of, of men alums across the generations who start out with an egalitarian expectation end up with a conventional arrangement. Okay, again, I'm, I'm making an assumption, I, I think, the vast majority of our alums, the majority of our alums are heterosexual, and we don't have very good information on the survey about sexual orientation. We have some, so it will be interesting to take a look at some of that. So what's the takeaway here? It seems that HBS alumni, particularly the men, have much more conventional expectations around child care than around career and that many alumni who started out with an egalitarian expectation ended up with a more conventional arrangement. Much more to dig into here. So now I'm going to turn to the last but the largest set of results I'll present today and to the question of what our alumni believe are the factors that have impeded women's advancement. The world has changed a good deal in the 50 years since HBS started admitting women to the two-year MBA program. But as we well know, women have not yet achieved parity with men in leadership positions. Women were making some progress in the 70s and 80s, but their progress has leveled off considerably in the last 20 years. So we asked you in the survey to share your thoughts about why women's career advancement has been so slow. And we gave you 14 factors proposed in the popular or scholarly literature as explanations. And we asked you to rate how strongly you agree or disagree that each factor has limited women's career advancement. And here's what you said. The number one barrier limiting women's career advancement is that women prioritize family over work. 75% of you agreed overall. Overall, 75% of you agreed with this. 82% of women and 74% of men. For women, this was the second highest barrier. The next one, the second barrier is taking leaves or reducing work hours. 68% overall agreed that this is a limiting factor for women's career advancement, 84% of the women, and 65% of the men. So 82% of the women say prioritizing family over work, 84% say taking leaves or reducing work hours. And I should note that for each of the 14 factors, more women than men rated it as a barrier. But for these four, these four are the factors on which men and women differed the most. Exclusion from informal networks, lack of influential sponsors and mentors, lack of a supportive work environment, and an inhospitable organizational culture such as dismissive behaviors and biased perceptions of women's roles. About three quarters of women um, agreed that these were barriers to women's advancement, whereas only about half of men did. Now before I start to unpack this slide, it is deceptively rich and deep. Let me read to you some of the responses people gave to the open-ended questions we asked, because sometimes the, the numbers need some fleshing out. I'll begin by reading the responses four men gave to the question we asked about how you defined success when you left HBS and how you define it now. Here's what one full-time working dad said his definition of success was when he left HBS. Becoming someone who was an expert at bringing new innovations to the marketplace. His definition now, 
Being married with two kids, I can no longer define success only from a career accomplishment perspective. Success to me is summed up in the following equations. He actually had them as equations. <laughs> he did. I, I thought it was actually lovely. <laughs> Family money earned is greater than, the greater than sign. Family money earned is greater than family money spent. <laughs> Dad's effort equals mom's effort. Helping others is greater than complaining about others. <laughs> nice. Family happiness is greater than anything else in the world. <laughs> and here's how a second dad defined success when he graduated. Money, money, money. And now, balance, balance, balance. <laughs> and from another, when he left HBS, good marriage and family, career that is rewarding and feeling like you're growing as a leader, mentor, and that would pay well. Now, very similar. Family and health are more important, though, as you realize that you only need to meet certain a certain baseline of career success. Anything beyond baseline on career success is great and desired, but is a bit of gravy on top. Family and health are most important. And finally, another full-time working dad, who only gave his current definition of success, said, professionally, two things. One, is my, work, is my working having a positive impact on clients' business? Two, Am I learning, progressing, and on track for partner? And, and in other parts of my life, am I being a good enough dad to my kids? Are they getting what they need and want from me? And do we have a great relationship? Am I being a good husband to my wife? Am I meeting her emotional needs as well as her financial needs? Now let me ask you. <laughs> I'd love to know what that giggle was about. <laughs> so think about those quotes, and let me ask you, in what order do you think these men prioritize work and family at this point in their lives? I'm betting that when push comes to shove, family's going to win. But it's interesting how these men talk about the things they've come to value in their lives since becoming parents. And it made me think of something a Stanford MBA said recently in an interview that was part of my research in a strategy consulting firm. He was explaining to me the reason from his perspective that so many highly talented, highly educated women were leaving his firm after having a child. Well, here's what he said. I believe deeply in my heart and soul that women encounter different challenges. There's the collusion of society that it's the woman who takes the extended maternity leave, and there are some biological imperatives too. When my first child was born, I got to carry her from the delivery room to the nursery. It's almost like I could feel the chemicals releasing in my brain. This one always chokes me up too. <laughs> I fell so chemically deeply in love with my daughter. I couldn't. <laughs> I couldn't imagine a world without her. I mean, here it was just in the first eight minutes of her life, so I can understand, how can I possibly give this up and go back to work? But back to work he went, and his takeaway understanding, remember where we started, was that women face problems with work family. Huh? Really? It sounded to me more like if he allowed himself to own and really hold on to those feelings he had when he held his daughter for the first time, 
that he would have had a hard time going back to work. In fact, that is what he said. How can I possibly give this up and go back to work? But he didn't do that. He didn't hold on to those feelings. He seems to have removed himself from them and projected them onto his women colleagues at work. That is so deep and so sad to me. Because the way our culture allows men to give priority to their families is very limited as a breadwinner. What does being the breadwinner for his family, does being a breadwinner really resonate for him with that chemical connection he felt with his daughter when she was eight minutes old? Or does it distance him, further pressuring him to comply with the image of the ideal worker, fully committed and available for work 24-7. So now listen to what a couple of the women alums wrote in their surveys. For this full-time working mom, success when she left HBS was having a job that was fulfilling and compensated me fairly, being happy, which included being intellectually challenged. I was hopeful that I would, hopeful that I would find a spouse and have a fulfilling marriage. And success now, according to this full-time working mom, being a loving mom to my children who are happy, spirited, and stimulated, being in a happy marriage, running a business in which clients find value in my services, earning enough money and managing what we have wisely so I don't have to worry about unexpected short-term events, having self-confidence, trying to force myself not to compare my relative lack of career success to my peers. My life did not turn out exactly as I planned. I don't have the thriving career I had envisioned or the large paycheck. It took me longer than expected to find my spouse. She adds later in her survey, I've been surprised at the disconnect of some organizations between what they say we value family and appreciate that you're a man who wants to be engaged, with, uh, a mom who wants to be engaged with your kids. And what they do, welcome to the firm, now go travel for 16 days straight. <laughs> Why is being a parent so counter to career success, she asks. And here's the response of a full-time working mom, a full-time working mom gave when asked at the end of the survey, what else, if anything, would you like to share regarding your life and leadership experience? She wrote, the only other observation I have about this survey is that my answers are very, felt very much like point in time answers. I might have answered differently a year ago on many of the questions, and imagine I'll answer differently when I begin my next chapter. Each new stage of my career involves shuffling of responsibilities in my household and a renegotiation with my husband about who does what. And it also seems to bring a reevaluation of expectations about myself, an increase or decrease in confidence, etc. It's definitely a journey with many ups and downs and is hard to capture at a point in time. As I think about this, I wonder how my classmates and friends from HBS are coping with the same issues. Now that I'm in a small organization, I'm isolated from other HBS MBAs. I wish I had a support network of others going through the same thing. So I, I hope this woman is here today. I really do. From another full-time working mom, it's a challenge to be a smart, driven, ambitious woman and still be a primary caregiver to one's children. We're taught that we can have it all, but there are sacrifices that need to be made, and women often feel as if they're failing or not living up to potential when making these sacrifices. And finally, from a woman at home, full-time, caring for her children. I have four children. The oldest is 16. I've worked part-time about nine years of the last 16. Part-time meaning almost full-time, but with flexible creative hours and scheduling. I last quit three years ago because I could not seem to get new challenges, project content, title, span of control, and became bored by the work. I had great reviews and the company liked me. But there appeared to be preconceived notions about part-time women, part women wanting less challenging work off track, when actually I was seeking the more challenging work and on some sort of track. A continual stream of new managers made it difficult to get that message sold again and again, despite my early successes in doing so. Now I think there's no question 
but that these women, like the men whose responses I just read, also prioritize family over work. But their narratives are so much more complex, so much more nuanced, aside from my Stanford MBA. There's pain in them, there's disappointment, there's loneliness, and there's joy too. But prioritizing family over work is more challenging for these women than for their male counterparts because their connections to their families are more complex than the, breadwin than the breadwinner connection so many men have had to settle for. I wanted to share these responses with you to suggest that maybe the issue isn't really that women prioritize family over work, whereas men do not. They all seem to prioritize family over work. It's that all these other factors are also at play for women. Lack of a supportive work environment, an inhospitable organizational culture. This is the difference between women and men. And as the last woman I quoted said, this is what pushed her out of the workforce. Not that she prioritized family over work. That when she went part-time and lost her supportive manager, she was seen as less than, as not wanting challenging work. She became bored. And let me reiterate the question of one of the other women I quoted. Uh, she asked, why is being a parent so counter to career success? Why? And is being a parent counter to career success, or is it being a mother? Or is it that being a mother is counter to career success in the kinds of organizations we've constructed? So what I'm trying to do here is to put this belief that the number one barrier to women's advancement is that they prioritize family over work in context. Let's put it in a context. And to suggest that if we believe that women prioritizing family over work is the main problem, we will have a very hard time accelerating the advancement of women leaders who make a difference in the world. Because prioritizing family over work probably isn't something that we want to change about ourselves if we hold that priority, or about others. I mean, is it? I don't think it's an actionable belief. I don't think it gives us any leverage. What gives us lever leverage is asking the question, what needs to change in our organizations that would enable us, women and men, to honor all the things we find meaningful in our lives, our work, our families, our communities, our friends? It's a daunting question for sure. It's not an impossible one, though. And as you go through these two days, ask yourself this question, what needs to change in our organizations? And if you hold a position of power in your organization, use it. Use it to see if you can create a wedge of change in the way work is done. A wedge that might enable people to bring their humanity to work and not feel they need to exit in order to have a life. The problem isn't women's priorities. It's work. It's the way we work, the way our organizations are structured to support the way we work. These are the problems to tackle. So as I said, the findings on this slide are deceptively rich and deep. As with all the findings, we've just scratched the surface, not just in the analysis of the data, but in their interpretation. So let's keep talking about it. I've covered a lot of ground here. Your heads are probably spinning. I hope I haven't tried to cram too much in. There's so much more. I said in the beginning, um, let, let me just stop here and offer some concluding thoughts, though. Um, I said in the beginning I wanted to challenge the conventional wisdom about elite educated women, and I hope I've done that by showing that far fewer of your fellow HBS alumni have opted out than we might be led to believe by the media or uh, than, than by our own necessarily limited and, and, and perhaps somewhat biased observations. I wanted to begin to reshape the dialogue about gender and work by suggesting some of the ways women's experience has been constrained, not only by the still highly gendered and really quite conventional expectations of those with whom we interact in our professional lives, 
um, but also with those with whom we interact, uh, are, are partnered with in our personal lives, and also by our own narratives of who we are. By our own narratives that construct our family priorities, or however we experience our humanity, as a barrier to our advancement. 82% of women believe prioritizing family over work is a barrier. Let's not let our own humanity, which we share with men, be a barrier. Finally, I said, I hoped that we would make these findings actionable. So let's think hard over these next two days and beyond about what we can do to dismantle the culture of overwork that's enslaving all of us. Thank you, and have a great summit.